few summers ago, my family, uh, just my family, went up to my dad's uh, cabin. Uh, it's kind of in a, a back corner of Michigan. Uh, it's near Walhalla. You know where Walhalla is? Walkerville. Ruby Creek store. I know that one. You've been to the Ruby Creek store. Uh, it's kind of a back corner, and that, uh, that is a part of the purpose of this story. Um, it, uh, it really is a nice cabin, has electricity, no phones, kind of a remote place. And we uh, went up there for the 4th of July. And uh, early on the morning of the 4th of July, I, the dog was whining to get out, and uh, I let the dog out. And uh, our dog has one of those endearing traits that sometimes it will uh, just bolt and disappear and then not come back. And uh, sadly, uh, on this 4th of July morning, that's exactly what my dog uh, did. Um, I was not happy. We'll just, let's be honest uh, here. I'm in my pajama pants, t-shirt, no shoes. I'm like, if I gotta go find the dog, I hopped in my truck and I'm like, I've gotta go find the dog. So I drove around and the dog likes to go on car rides and I got the dog back and then I made a fateful decision. Uh, I decided, you know what, it's so nice, it's early in the morning, the rest of the family's not got, gotten up yet. I think I'll just go for a little bit of drive, I'll go out to where we hunt, this will be nice. And, and so I did. Uh, I drove, it was a beautiful morning, saw some deer, it was great. Drove out to my, where I hunt, and that's when I got the truck stuck. Uh, now when I got the truck stuck, uh, I was in my pajamas, I mentioned that. Uh, and really, there's, there's not a lot around Walhalla and the Ruby Creek store and, and even Walkerville. Uh, but the good news is, there was good news. The good news is, at my hunting stand, I get cell service, uh, unlike at the cabin or anywhere else nearby. And so I had a brilliant idea. I called my dad. Dads are good like that aren't they, for getting calls on the 4th of July morning. I called my dad and I said, how are you doing today? He said, oh, doing good. I said, were you thinking about coming up to the cabin today? I thought about it, but no, wasn't planning on going up to the, the cabin today. Why do you ask? Where are you? Well, I said, funny thing, Dad, I'm, I'm stuck out at my hunting blind and uh, I can't move. And I can't call Rhonda and she doesn't even have a car there and it's the 4th of July and uh, a tow truck of some kind and that distance is going to be a little difficult, probably kind of expensive on 4th of July in the middle of nowhere, coming from Ludington maybe, I don't know. And my dad, my dad, my dad loves me. My dad cares. My dad said, well, man, it's about a three mile walk if you go th by the road, but it's only two miles if you cut right through the woods back to the house. You know what, that wasn't the help that I was expecting from my dad uh, on that fateful morning. Uh, I was hoping uh, that he would come in and rescue uh, me. Um, it all planned out workably. You know, my dad's retired. He has time. He's able to come. Uh, I had a perfect plan of how my dad uh, could solve my problem, but my dad was not willing to do so. Uh, don't be mad at my dad. In fact, you're not. You're laughing at me, uh, really. I had a nice walk in my pajamas uh, back along the dirt roads. And actually, the nice thing in that neighborhood, uh, I was not the most poorly dressed person that you see uh, up, in the, uh, up in the country there. And uh, we got to meet some new neighbors, and it all worked out uh, in the end. Uh, you know, what? I often uh, have ideas about what help other people should give me. You know what? If my wife helped me just the way that I expect her to, we would be so happy uh, all the time. Uh, you know what, if my coworkers helped me uh, in the way that I wish that they would, everything would run more smoothly. It would be better if they would do things just the way that I expect. Uh, and you know what, the fact of the matter is I am probably not alone in thinking uh, that, you know what, if God, if God helped me just the way that I wanted to, if he appeared just the way that I think that he should. Life would be pretty good, don't you think? If he would. But would anyone share the experience that God doesn't always give the kind of help that we were expecting? Uh, we are continuing in our series uh, in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 28 is where we're at. I'd encourage you to turn in your Bibles there. Uh, and in Luke 19, we're going to 
experience a familiar passage. Uh, it's the passage of the triumphal entry of Christ uh, into Jerusalem. Uh, you know what, I, uh, Pastor Chris was telling me that I often complain about the passages that he gives me to preach on, and so I've committed uh, myself to not say anything about preaching a Palm Sunday passage uh, a month before Easter. Um, I'm not going to draw attention. In fact, the only reason I mention that is because I don't want to confuse any of you who might be thinking that Easter is next week uh, because we're preaching Palm Sunday. But we're not. We're just going to preach this message because this is where we are at uh, in the book of Luke. Uh, and in the next two chapters, actually, there's some great passages as Jesus interacts in the last uh, week uh, before uh, his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection, uh, his uh, interactions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, but we are in Luke chapter 19, and we're going to consider verses 28 through uh, 48. Let's begin by reading uh, in verse 28. It says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he draw near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. But those who were sent away, so those who were sent away found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're out of line. They're saying too much. They're going to cause trouble. Uh, but Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. I will stop there. Well, this passage is a familiar one. Uh, I break it down in my own uh, thinking into a period of preparation, uh, the preparation for Jesus' entry. Uh, his presentation in verses 35 to 40 and then finally, we're going to consider his resignation. Not Jesus resigning, but what he resigned himself to experiencing. Uh, but first of all, Jesus' preparation. Uh, in the weeks leading up to this uh, passage, we have seen that Jesus has been teaching. Uh, he's been teaching most recently in Jericho. Uh, and all through the book of Luke, Jesus has been, uh, Luke, as he's writing this book, says Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. He's preparing his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem and that something big is going to happen there. Uh, at times, he shared with the disciples that this is ultimately, uh, he is going, and he is going to die. Uh, but we know that his disciples didn't truly understand this. They are on the cusp of something significant, and they misread the signs. They did not understand. Uh, to set the stage, I'd like you to, to visualize, uh, as best you can, uh, that Jesus is coming. He's coming to Jerusalem for the east, and we're going uh, to call these two curtains over here Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is built on a mountain, Mount Zion, uh, we call it. And uh, as Jesus comes from the east, um, there's another mountain called the Mount of Olives, uh, another hill uh, that is famous for the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the villages of Bethpage and Bethany are uh, approaching that mountain. And in between the two mountains, there's a valley. It's called the Kidron Valley, uh, a slight depression that goes down and uh, then rises up to the capital city, the center of Israel, its culture, its religion, and everything. And as Jesus enters the city of Bethpage and Bethany, uh, on the Mount of Olives, this first mountain, 
uh, he tells his disciples to go on ahead into the village, and uh, there you're going to find a donkey, and I want you to bring that to me. Uh, now, to be honest, when I read that, it raises a couple of mysteries, a mystery about the donkeys. Uh, one mystery is a practical mystery. What is happening here? Are Jesus' disciples, are they stealing a donkey? Uh, is this some type of uh, prearrangement that he has made? Um, is he like a, a Roman soldier who can say, you know what, we're taking this uh, into the, our service and there's nothing that you can do about this? What is the, the practical, what practically is happening? Uh, but secondly, there's a theological problem. What exactly is the meaning of this donkey? Uh, well, Jesus sends his disciples in. And to be honest, we don't get a full and complete answer in Scripture. Um, it is possible that this is something that Jesus had prearranged. And as we read the story that Jesus had made an arrangement with the owner of this donkey, but uh, the servants of the owner of the donkey are the ones who the disciples talked to, and they said, hey, what are you doing? We didn't know anything about this. And he says, the Lord has need of it. Um, or it is also possible uh, that this is something that uh, is a courtesy that these folks were giving to a famous rabbi, uh, that this does not tell us the whole of the conversation, but when they understood who this Lord was, this Rabbi Jesus, who is famous, um, they said, you know what, this is the hospitality that we give uh, to him. Uh, I tend to think that that is uh, what is going on here. That when they said, this is the Jesus that we've heard so much, absolutely, you, I am more than happy to lend my donkey uh, for him to enter into the city. But the second question, the, the practical and somewhat theological question is, why a donkey? Uh, donkeys are not the most impressive of animals. Uh, the only time we see people reading on donkey is when the school wants to do a fundraiser and they're going to play a basketball game with people on donkeys. And we do it uh, out of the, the ridiculousness of it. Why in the world is Jesus on a colt, uh, a young donkey that has never been written? The answer to that question is that Jesus' entire life uh, fulfills patterns that have been laid down by God providentially uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 32 through 40, we read of, of David and Solomon. Uh, David had someone who was attempting to, David was very old in 1 Kings chapter 1, and uh, one of his sons was attempting to crown himself king, uh, a son that David did not intend to keep uh, the throne. And at the end of 1 Kings chapter 1, it says that David, uh, when he became aware of this plot, he took his son Solomon and he said, put him on my own donkey and I want you to take him and I want you to anoint him uh, with the priest uh, as my king and heir. He's going to become the king uh, right now. Uh, Jesus fulfills this pattern that we see laid down. Uh, we see uh, another king, uh, Absalom, raised, riding a donkey as well. Uh, the donkey was a symbol of a peaceful uh, king. Uh, a king who doesn't come on a, a white charger with an army behind him, but one that comes in peace and dignity to rule over those people. Uh, in fact, we see this in what this is most clearly a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, in Zechariah 9.9, 9, uh, the prophet Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus comes riding on a donkey as a symbol of a peaceful ruler, a peaceful ruler who uh, is coming to bring peace to his people and not to bring war. He comes in fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, he comes identifying with the poor and needy. Uh, he had to borrow his own a donkey for his own entry uh, into the city. Uh, Jesus is coming uh, prepared uh, to be the king in fulfillment of prophecy so that others would recognize uh, that he was, who he was. But unfortunately, as we'll see, the people missed it. Uh, and that perhaps is the first danger that we all face uh, when we have a very clear idea of the kind of help that God should give us, the kind of king 
that we should receive. Uh, Jesus was fulfilling the role uh, that was prophesied in the Old Testament as a king, uh, but it wasn't the king that they were expecting, not that kind anyway. And, and the problem when we have expectations of exactly how God should respond, we miss the God that we have in looking for the God that we wish that we have. Uh, the God is, is the same, uh, working out his plan and his purpose. Uh, but when we're looking for one kind of answer, uh, if we are so intent upon that God that we are expecting, that kind of help that we know that we need, we are in danger of missing the God that we actually have. You know, sometimes when I uh, take my kids to school in the morning, they fight. I know your kids don't. Mine do. Uh, sometimes they uh, quibble with each other, they fight, they spat. And, and as a parent, sometimes my temptation is to say, you know what, I'm going to settle this. Uh, let's hear the facts in the story. Let's say, you're wrong, you're right, you be quiet, you be quiet too. All right, uh, it's settled and done. Sometimes that is my, my desire as parents, to be judge and jury and to execute justice in those situations. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes their quibbles are really hard to sort out. Uh, it's not because they're significant, uh, but the challenges that they face, uh, what they're arguing about, really, uh, it's almost impossible to unwind in those instances. And sometimes, on my really good days as a parent, uh, as I'm driving to school, as they're quibbling with each other, I, you know what I say to them? I say, you know what, look out there at that sunrise this morning. Do you see all of the different colors that God has made in, their, in his beauty and his greatness? That is amazing. I don't think I've seen any sky like that at all. And you know what, when I say that sometimes, and once again, this is on the good days, uh, my kids look and they see the greatness of something that God has done and that God does every day. And that God does every day whether people notice it or not, whether they pay attention to it or not and he just extravagantly passes out uh, this beauty and this elegance. And sometimes when they see that, they forget what they're arguing about. And it doesn't seem that significant anymore uh, because they realize that there is something that is good in this world. There is something that is beautiful and it's great. And it comes from the hand of our God. Uh, if we look for the God who just is going to settle the arguments and is going to make things right by my definition of right, sometimes in doing so it is easy for us to miss the God that we have and the glory and the righteousness uh, that he does offer. Uh, he is good. Jesus came, a humble king, bringing peace to be recognized by his people. He comes uh, prepared for in the Old Testament, recognized by some, but as we'll see, uh, by not by all. Uh, in Luke 19, 35 and 40, we see his presentation. Jesus enters. His disciples uh, lay him on the coat. The, the familiar image of them laying their coats and uh, other passages talk about laying palm branches before him in the parallel passages in Matthew uh, and in Mark, um, paving the way for the king as he enters. Uh, it says the whole multitude of his disciples were coming. Uh, this isn't just the 12. This is the, the, the crowd of followers of Jesus are coming, and they recognize him. Uh, they sing a psalm uh, from Psalm 118. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Um, the disciples, in, in some ways they do read the signs rightly. They recognize that Jesus is king. Uh, but I can't help but think that there is a hint in here, that the disciples are saying, you know what, if we could generate the proper energy and enthusiasm uh, for this Jesus, who knows what he will do? I, I can imagine that some of his disciples, they already have uh, in their mind, they've worked things out uh, pretty well. They knew what type of king they needed. They needed a king who would free them from oppression would deliver them from the Romans who ruled over their land. That's what they were hoping for. Uh, and Jesus, oh, Jesus, what a king he could be. They'd seen Jesus calm a storm cloud. Couldn't that kind of king deliver some lightning bolts in a battle at just the right time and the place? 
uh, they had seen Jesus feed 5,000 people from a few loaves of bread. Couldn't you see some disciples say, you know what? Let the Romans lay siege to our capital city. Jesus will keep multiplying the loaves. We'll be fed uh, forever. We can outlast any foreign army in our, in our city. They had seen Jesus heal the sick, send our army into battle. Uh, when someone's hurt, we send them back to our king, and he heals them, and he goes back. We never run out of soldiers because of our king, what he's done. Uh, I have a perfect sense uh, of exactly what Jesus can and should do, uh, these disciples could have said. They could have believed, and they, they said, praise to him. In, in one sense, this is an authentic uh, expression of praise to them, uh, but I can't help but think that the disciples are saying, this could be the start of something big. The part, the part that we have been waiting for, and it is all laid out in front of me. It makes perfect sense. I know exactly how this should work. As he did so, uh, even his disciples misread uh, that Jesus was not the kind of king they were expecting. His ministry was not uh, the victory that he was giving. Uh, like us, when we don't receive the answer we were wanting, nor the victory that we were seeking, and we say, you know what, he's not exactly the God that I thought that I had ordered. Oh, I know we would never say that way, but we think in our hearts, you know what, I know exactly what God needs to do. Uh, and then when he acts in ways that don't expect it, we say, ah, I thought he would be taller or stronger, or riding on a white horse with a sword and an army behind him, and, and that he would put us first, and he'd get rid of all of those uh, other Romans or whatever is afflicting us. Unfortunately, God does not always work in the time that I desire. He does not always respond in the manner that I required. And the question is, how will I respond? Uh, really, there's a bigger question there. Uh, sometimes when I have it all laid out exactly how God should work out my life, how he should answer my prayers, uh, in a sense, what I am saying in my heart is that I would make a better God uh, than him. You know what? If I were to lay it out, I would make a better God with him. I have a better idea of how to work things out. Uh, that's dangerous ground to tread. Um, it's dangerous, but it's also foolish. Uh, you know what? I have a hard time filling out an NCAA tournament bracket uh, and getting the first 30 games uh, right. And, and I will be better at laying out uh, the plan for my life and the lives of those that I touch. Um, if you're here with your family member, I want you to look at them right now for a second. Look at them. If you don't have a family member, look at somebody else that's nice uh, there. Uh, look at your, your husband, your wife, your children, and say, you know what? Look deep into their eyes and say, if they worked out your life just the way they think it ought to be, would your life be better? All right, that, that was too ambiguous. Joanne, if Steve worked out your life just the way that Steve thinks is wisest and best, would your life be better? I don't know uh, about that. You know, this is, this is pleasing one person. Say, so you know what, Ken, if you're, Rhonda, if, if Ken just plans out your life and works your life just the way that he seems best, does your life seem happier already? I don't know. You know what? The person that I love the most, that I'm closest to, that I know the best, she can't trust me to work out my life and her life for her best interest. And I think that I am wise enough to plan out my life and the life of an entire world according to what is best. That's foolish. God is always at work. God is always doing more than we expect. He is always accomplishing his purpose and his plans. And it's complex. There's a lot of moving parts. And sometimes we don't do it. But the fact of the matter is, and as you look into your, your spouse's eyes, perhaps you realize, you know, often when I say, you know what, I know exactly what God should do, what I'm really saying is I know exactly what God should do for me, and I don't really care that much 
about most everyone else. Not the people way in the opposite corner of the sanctuary, maybe not even the people in the same row that I'm sitting. I know what I'd like God to do for me, and that's my primary, perhaps sole, concern. We care about others. Uh, but the responsibility of planning out exactly how their life and my life should go is too big for us. When we say, you know what, I have the perfect plan, I've got it all worked out, I know exactly what God should do, uh, I, am, I am saying that I am wiser than God, and in my heart of hearts I know that that is not true. It is not true uh, that I could do a better job than God in planning out my life. So what does God want? What does he require uh, of us? Well, in Luke chapter 19, what God wanted, what Jesus wanted is his people to recognize him as king. Uh, a king, not a servant. Uh, a king who could be trusted uh, to work out his plans and in his time. Uh, he wanted them to let God be God. Um, but that is so difficult uh, for us. Jesus came in fulfillment of prophecy. He fulfilled the pattern that was laid down in the Old Testament. He came in a way that recognized him as a, as a ruler. He had displayed great works of mighty power. And his disciples, they recognized it, but they wanted a little bit more. And the Pharisees, they saw him and they said, we want a little bit less. They said, and to be honest, we don't know their entire motivation. Some scholars say, you know what, these may have been Pharisees who were somewhat sympathetic to Jesus, uh, were curious and, and possibly entertaining, who is this Messiah? But they said, Jesus, you do this king, or disciples, you, let, you do all this king talk, and the Roman legions are going to come back in and they're going to take away our place. Uh, things are okay now, let's not rock the boat. Or it is possible that these were Pharisees who were antagonistic to Jesus. And they said, you know what? Uh, you have no place. This is blasphemy, what you are saying. He is not the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, we cannot trust this itinerant uh, preacher from a backwoods town uh, to bring peace to us and to be our Messiah. Rebuke your disciples, teacher. Don't let them say such things. Uh, but Jesus says, if I tell you if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. Uh, this is the, uh, really the dominant passage that tells us that there is more going on here than immediately meets the eye. Uh, why is it in this time and in this place that Jesus would say that, that stones themselves would cry out? Uh, because in God's plan, uh, here in Luke chapter 19, Jesus is presenting himself officially to his people. He has laid the groundwork by establishing himself in his power, in his greatness, in his glory. Uh, but now he is coming, and it is time for a verdict to be offered by the people of Israel. Will you receive your king? He comes to you bringing peace, riding on a donkey, in fulfillment of prophecy, uh, prepared to be your deliverer in his way, but not in your way. But for the citizens of Jerusalem as a whole, he wasn't the kind of king that they were looking for. They wanted something uh, different. And so we read of Jesus' res recognition and his resignation. Uh, not that he is resigning, but his, his statement to say, I realize what is going to happen. It says, when he drew near, and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. There's a path forward. There's a path for peace. It's laid out before you. Jesus can see it. But the city as a whole does not recognize it. And instead of peace will come war. And their enemies would set up a barricade. Uh, they'd be surrounded. Uh, the city would be destroyed. Uh, ultimately, this was fulfilled 30 years later uh, when the Roman uh, legions did indeed, actually 40 years later, coming uh, in from 66 to 70 AD, laying siege to Jerusalem uh, and defeating the nation of Israel. But I want you to focus on Jesus here. Jesus, Jesus knows that he's not fulfilling the expectations that he has. He knows that they have mistaken expectations of uh, what they want. 
Uh, but notice what Jesus' heart uh, is. Uh, rather than being angry, irritated, rather than turning in judgment on these people that are rejecting him, uh, Jesus is sorrowful. Jesus has come to Jerusalem uh, at long last, and they don't recognize it. You know, the fact of the matter is, uh, for all that I've said thus far uh, in this message, there are times when God doesn't do things the way that I think that he should. That he doesn't answer a prayer quicker, quick enough. That he doesn't uh, resolve my problems in the way that I think is right. In times of untimely death, uh, even, that I say, why can't he just do it the way that I want? Why can't he just do it? It seems so simple. Isn't there a little bit better way that God could work things out? It is in those times that we have to remember who Jesus is and his heart for us. Jesus, as he's being presented as king and rejected as king, uh, rather than anger, he responds in sorrow because he does know, he does feel the pain that his city and his people will experience uh, in uh, a relatively short amount of time. He knows the cost of their rejection. It is cost on himself, yes, but in this passage, uh, his heart is really for his people in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he is reiterating something that he said back in Luke chapter 12. Uh, at the end of that chapter, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings and protect her. I long to keep you safe, uh, but for me to keep you safe, you must receive me as king. Jesus would love to bring peace. He would love to make your dreams come true, uh, but peace only comes through receiving the king as king, not as my servant that he doesn't exist to serve me, but he is my king. Uh, uh, Jesus, how does Jesus know that the people are rejecting him? That's what the Pharisees had said. Uh, as we wrap up the chapter, when he enters the temple, uh, it says in verse 45, he began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. As he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Jesus could see uh, that, he, the, that he was not recognized as his king. Uh, to be honest, he, uh, a prophecy was being fulfilled way back in Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, we read of Jesus uh, coming to earth as a child and his first appearance, or as a baby, and in his first appearance in the temple, when his parents brought him to dedicate him, uh, a man by the name of Simeon said, uh, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many. Uh, Jesus came ready to lift people up if they received him, if they recognized the time of God's visitation with him. But because they did not, it would cause the falling uh, of many. He wasn't the kind of king they were expecting, and in doing so, uh, they missed him. They missed everything. So what does God want? If we don't want to have uh, expectations and then miss what God is actually doing, how do we respond uh, to God uh, when he comes in a way that we are not expecting, when his answers are not as we see them, but are a part uh, of his plan. 1 Peter 5, 6 says that we respond with patience. He says, uh, God resists the proud, but he lifts up the humble in due season. Uh, those who wait in season will see God deliver them. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, 5 through 10, uh, G, uh, Paul responds to some teachers who were saying, you know what? Uh, actually, it's a very interesting passage. He says, you know, some of you thought that Godliness was a means for gain. Uh, he says in 1 Timothy 6, 5, Godliness was a means for gain, that somehow uh, you were going to be godly and so that you would, you would get, uh, either from God or from others, that, that godliness was some strategy for gain. But he said, you know what, godliness with contentment is great gain. What does God want? God wants us to be content. Uh, most of all, what does God want? 
God wants to, us to receive him as our king and Lord, the one who is worthy of our loyalty and, yes, uh, our trust. So how are you doing? Uh, I suspect that every person in this room has something that they have prayed to about God, some, some answer uh, that you would like to see God do uh, in your life. Is he giving you the kind of answer that you are expecting? Uh, is he doing it in the time that you are expecting? You know what, there is nothing wrong for us to pray because we do have a king whose heart uh, is for us. Uh, but as we pray, we must always remember that he is the king, regardless of what I am expecting. That he is the king who desires to bring peace and is accomplishing it in his time. And he is trustworthy. Uh, let's pray.